Agatha Christie's Death on the Nile. Dedicated to Sybil Burnett, who also loves wandering about the world. Part 1, Chapter 1 Lynette Ridgeway. That's her, said Mr. Burnaby, the landlord of the Three Crowns. He nudged his companion. The two men stared with round, bucolic eyes and slightly open mouths. A big scarlet Rolls Royce had just stopped in front of the local post office. A girl jumped out, a girl without a hat and wearing a frock that looked, but only looked, simple. A girl with golden hair and straight, autocratic features. A girl with a lovely shape. A girl such as was seldom seen in Malden Underwood. With a quick, imperative step, she passed into the post office. That's her, said Mr. Burnaby again. And he went on in a low, awed voice. Millions she's got. Going to spend thousands on the place. Swimming pools, there's going to be an Italian gardens, and a ballroom, and a half of the house pulled down and rebuilt. She'll bring money into the town, said his friend. He was a lean, seedy looking man, his tone envious and grudging. Mr. Burnaby agreed. Yes, it's a great thing for Molten Underworld. A great thing it is. Mr. Burnaby was complacent about it. We us all up proper, he added. A bit of a difference from Sir George, said the other. Uh, it was the horses did for him, said Mr. Burnaby indulgently. Never had no luck. What did he get for the place? A cool sixty thousand, sir? The lean man whistled. Mr. Burnaby went on triumphantly. And they say she'll have to spend another 60000 before she's finished. Wicked, said the lean man. Where'd she get all that money from? America, Zoever. Her mother was the only daughter of one of those millionaire blokes. Quite like the pictures, isn't it? The girl came out of the post office and climbed into the car. As she drove off, the lean man followed her with his eyes. He muttered, it seems all wrong to me, her looking like that. Money and looks, it's too much. If a girl's as rich as that, she's no right to be a good looker as well. And she is a good looker. Got everything that girl has. Doesn't seem fair. Section 2 Extract from the social column of the Daily Blog among those supping at Che Montante, I noticed beautiful Lynette Ridgway. She was with Honorable Joanna Southwood, Lord Windlesham, and Mr. Toby Bryce. Miss Ridgway, as everyone knows, is the daughter of Mellowish Ridgway, who married Anna Hartz. She inherits from her grandfather, Leopold Hartz, an immense fortune. The lovely Lynette is the sensation of the moment, and it is rumored that an engagement may be announced shortly. Certainly Lord Windleham seemed very happy. Section 3 The Honorable Joanna Southwood said, Darling, I think it's going to be all perfectly marvelous. She was sitting in Lynette Ridgway's bedroom at Wood Hall. From the window, the eye passed over the gardens to open country with blue shadows of woodlands. It is rather perfect, isn't it? said Lynette. She leaned her arms on the window sill. Her face was eager, alive, dynamic. Beside her, Mrs. Joanna Southwood seemed somehow a little dim. A tall, thin young woman of twenty-seven, with a long, clever face and freakishly plucked eyebrows. And you've done so much in the time. Did you have lots of architects and things? Three. What are architects like? I don't think I've ever met any. They were all right. I found them rather unpractical sometimes. 
Darling, you soon put that right. You are the most practical creature. Joanna picked up a string of pearls from the dressing table. I suppose these are real, aren't they, Lynette? Of course. I know it's of course to you, my sweet, but it wouldn't be to most people, heavily cultured or even Woolworth. Darling, they really are incredible, so exquisitely matched, it must be worth the most fabulous sums. Rather vulgar, you think? No, not at all, just pure beauty. What are they worth? About fifty thousand. What a lovely lot of money. Aren't you afraid of having them stolen? No. I always wear them. Anyway, they're insured. Let me wear them till dinner time, will you, darling? It would give me such a thrill. Lynette laughed. Of course, if you like. You know, Lynette, I really do envy you. You've simply got everything. Here you are at twenty. Your own mistress, with any amount of money, looks, superb health. You've even got brains. When are you twenty-one? Next June, I shall have a grand coming-of-age party in London. And then you're going to marry Charles Mendelssohn. Oh, the dreadful little gossip writers are getting so excited about it. He really is frightfully devoted. Lynette shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. I don't really want to marry anyone yet. And darling, how right you are. It's never quite the same afterwards, is it? The telephone shrilled and Lynette went to it. Yeah? Yeah? The butler's voice answered her. Mr. Belfort is on the line. Shall I put her through? Belfort? Oh, of course, yes. Put her through. A click and a voice, an eager, soft, slightly breathless voice. Hello, is that Miss Ridgeway? Lynette? Jackie, darling, I haven't heard anything of you for ages and ages. I know, it's awful, Lynette. I want to see you terribly. Darling, can't you come down here? My new toy, I'd love to show it to you. That's just what I want to do. Well, jump into a train or a car. Right, I will. A frightfully dilapidated two-seater. I bought it for fifteen pounds, and some days it goes beautifully. But it has moods. If I haven't arrived by tea time, you'll know it's had a mood. So long, my sweet. Lynette replaced the receiver. She crossed back to Joanna. That's my oldest friend, Jacqueline de Belfort. We were together at a convent in Paris. She's had the most terribly bad luck. Her father was a French count. Her mother was American. Southerner. The father went off with some woman, and her mother lost all her money in the Wall Street crash. Jackie was left absolutely broke. I don't know how she's managed to get along the last two years. Joanna was polishing her deep, blood-colored nails with her friend's nail bed. She leant back with her head on one side, scrutinizing the effect. Darling, she drawled, won't that be rather tiresome? If any misfortunes happen to my friends, I always drop them at once. It sounds heartless, but it saves such a lot of trouble later. They always want to borrow money off you, else they start a dressmaking business, and you have to get the most terrible clothes from them, or they paint lampshades or do batik scarves. So, if I lost all my money, you'd drop me tomorrow? Yes, darling, I would. You can't say I'm not honest about it. I only like successful people. And you'll find that's true of nearly everybody, only most people won't admit it. They just say that they really can't put up with Mary, or Emily, or Pamela anymore. Her troubles have made her so bitter and peculiar, poor oh dear. How beastly you are, Joanna. I'm only on the make, like everyone else. I'm not on the make. For 
obvious reasons. You don't have to be sordid when good-looking middle-aged American trustees pay you over a vast allowance every quarter. And you're wrong about Jacqueline, said Lynette. She's not a sponge. I wanted to help her, but she won't let me. She's as proud as the devil. What's she in such a hurry to see you for? I'll bet she wants something. You just wait and see. She sounded excited about something, admitted Lynette. Jackie always did get frightfully worked up over things. She once stuck a penknife into someone. Darling, how thrilling. A boy who was teasing a dog. Jackie tried to get him to stop. He wouldn't. She pulled him and shook him, but he was much stronger than she was. And at last she whipped out a pen knife and plunged it right into him. It was the most awful row. I should think so. It sounds most uncomfortable. Lynette's maid entered the room. With a murmured word of apology, she took down a dress from the wardrobe and went out of the room with it. What's the matter with Marie? asked Joanna. She's been crying. Poor thing. You know I told you she wanted to marry a man who was a job in Egypt. She didn't know much about him, so I thought I'd better make sure he was all right. It turned out that he had a wife already. And three children. What a lot of enemies you must make, Lynette. Enemies? Lynette looked surprised. Joanna nodded and helped herself to a cigarette. Enemies, my sweet. You're so devastatingly efficient, and you're so frightfully good at doing the right thing. Lynette laughed. Why, I haven't got an enemy in the world. Section 4 Lord Windlesham sat under the cedar tree. His eyes rested on the graceful proportions of Wode Hall. There was nothing to mar its old world beauty. The new buildings and additions were out of sight round the corner. It was a fair and peaceful sight bathed in the autumn sunshine. Nevertheless, as he gazed, it was no longer Wode Hall that Charles Windlesham Shaw. Instead, he seemed to see a more imposing Elizabethan mansion, a long sweep of park, a bleaker background. It was his old family seat, Charltonbury, and in the foreground stood a figure, a girl's figure with bright golden hair and an eager, confident face, Lynette, as mistress of Charltonbury. He felt very hopeful. That refusal of hers had not been at all a definite refusal. It had been little more than a plea for time. Well, he could afford to wait a little. How amazingly suitable the whole thing was. It was certainly advisable that he should marry money, but not such a matter of necessity that he could regard himself as forced to put his own feelings on one side. And he loved Lynette. He would have wanted to marry her even if she had been practically penniless instead of one of the richest girls in England. Only, fortunately, she was one of the richest girls in England. His mind played with attractive plans for the future. The mastership of the Roxdale, perhaps. The restoration of the West Wing. No need to let the Scot shooting. Charles Windlesham dreamed in the sun. Section 5 it was four o'clock when the dilapidated little two-seater stopped with a sound of crunching gravel. A girl got out of it, a small, slender creature with a mop of dark hair. She ran up the steps and tugged at the bell. A few minutes later, she was being ushered into the long, stately drawing room, and an ecclesiastical butler was saying with the proper mournful intonation, Ms. de Belvoir. Lynette! Jackie! Windlesham stood a little aside, watching sympathetically as this fiery little creature flung herself open-armed upon Lynette. Lord Windlesham, Mr. Belfort, my best friend. A pretty child, he thought. Not really pretty, but decidedly attractive, with her dark curly hair and her enormous eyes. He murmured a few tactful nothings, and then managed unobtrusively to leave the two friends together. 
Jacqueline pounced in a fashion that Lynette remembered as being characteristic of her. Wendelsham? Wendelsham? That's the man the papers always say you're going to marry. Are you, Lynette? Are you? Lynette murmured. Perhaps. Darling, I'm so glad. He looks nice. Oh, don't make up your mind about it. I haven't made up my own mind yet. Of course not. Queens always proceed with due deliberation to the choosing of a consort. Don't be ridiculous, Jackie. But you are a queen, Lynette. You always were. Sa Majesté, la Reine Lynette, Lynette la Blonde. And I, I'm the queen's confidant, the trusted maid of honor. What nonsense you talk, Jackie, darling. Where have you been all this time? You just disappear, and you never write. I hate writing letters. Where have I been? Oh, about three parts submerged, darling. In jobs, you know. Grim jobs with grim women. Darling, I wish you'd take the Queen's bounty. Oh, frankly, darling, that's what I'm here for. No, not to borrow money. It's not got to that yet. But I've come to ask a great, big, important favor. Go on. If you're going to marry the Windlesham man, you'll understand, perhaps. Lynette looked puzzled for a minute, then her face cleared. Jackie, do you mean? Yes, darling, I'm engaged. So that's it. I thought you were looking particularly alive somehow. You always do, of course, but even more than usual. That's just what I feel like. Tell me all about him. His name, Simon Doyle, is big and square and incredibly simple and boyish. Utterly oh, adorable. He's poor. Got no money. He's what you'd call county, all right. That very impoverished county. A younger son and all that. His people come from Devonshire. He loves country and country things. And for the last five years, he's been on the city in a stuffy office. And now they're cutting down, and he's out of a job, Lynette. I shall die if I can't marry him. I shall die. I shall die. I shall die. Don't be ridiculous, Jackie. I shall die, I tell you. I'm crazy about him. He's crazy about me. We can't live without each other. Darling, you have got it badly. I know it's awful, isn't it? They love business, and it gets hold of you, and you can't do anything about it. She paused for a minute. Her dark eyes dilated, looked suddenly tragic. She gave a little shiver. It's even frightening sometimes. Simon and I were made for each other. I shall never care for anyone else. And you've got to help us, Lynette. I heard you'd bought this place, and it put an idea into my head. Listen, you'll have to have a land agent. Perhaps two. I want you to give the job to Simon. Oh. Lynette was startled. Jacqueline rushed on. He's got all that sort of thing at his fingertips. He knows all about estates, was brought up on one, and he's got his business training, too. Oh, Lynette, you will give him a job, won't you? For love of me. If it doesn't make good, sack him, but he will, and we can live him in a little house, and I shall see lots of you, and everything in the garden will be too. Too divine. She got up. Say you will, Lynette. Say you will. Beautiful Lynette. Tall, golden Lynette. My own very special Lynette. Say you will. Jackie. You will? Lynette burst out laughing. Ridiculous, Jackie. Bring along your young man and let me have a look at him, and we'll talk it over. Jackie darted at her, kissing her exuberantly. Darling Lynette, you're a real friend. I knew you were. You wouldn't let me down, never. You're just the loveliest thing in the world. Goodbye. But Jackie, you're staying. Me? No, I'm not. 
I'm going back to London, and tomorrow I'll come back and bring Simon, and we'll settle it all up. You'll adore him. He really is a pet. But can't you wait and just have tea? No, I can't wait, Lynette. I'm too excited. I must get back and tell Simon. I know I'm mad, darling, but I can't help it. Marriage will cure me, I expect. It always seems to have a very sobering effect on people. She turned to the door, stood a moment, then rushed back for a last quick bird-like embrace. Dear Lynette, there's no one like you. Section 6 M. Gaston Blondin, the proprietor of that modish little restaurant, Chez Matin, was not a man who delighted to honor many of his clientele. The rich, the beautiful, the notorious, and the well-born might wait in vain to be signaled out and paid special attention. Only in the rarest cases did M. Blondin, with gracious condescension, greet a guest, accompany him to a privileged table, and exchange with him suitable and opposite remarks. On this particular night, M. Blondin had exercised his royal prerogative three times, once for a duchess, once for a famous racing peer, and once for a little man of comical appearance with immense black moustaches, and who, my casual onlooker would have thought, could bestow no favor on Chez by his presence there. M. Blondin, however, was positively fulsome in his attentions, though clients have been told for the last half hour that a table was not to be had, one now mysteriously appeared, placed in a most favorable position. M. Blondin conducted the client to it with every appearance of impressment. But naturally, for you, there is always a table, mon Roboro. How I wish that you would honor us oftener. Hercule Poirot smiled, remembering that past incident were in a dead body. A waiter, M. Blondin, and a very lovely lady had played a part. You are too amiable, Mojo Blondin, he said. And you are alone, Mojo Poirot? Yes, I am alone. Oh, well, Jules here will compose for you a little meal. It will be a poem, positively a poem. Women, however charming, have this disadvantage. They distract the mind from food. You will enjoy your dinner, Mojo Poirot. I promise you that now. As to wine, a technical conversation ensued, Jules, the maitre d'hôtel, assisting. Before departing, Mojo Blondin lingered a moment, lowering his voice confidentially. You have grave affairs on hand? Poirot shook his head. I am, alas, a man of leisure, he said sadly. I have made the economies in my time and I have now the means to enjoy a life of idleness. I envy you. No, no, you would be unwise to do so. I can assure you, it is not so gay as it sounds, he sighed. How true is the saying that man was forced to invent work in order to escape the strain of having to think. Mojo Blondin threw up his hands. But there is so much. There is travel. Yes, there is travel. Already I have done not so badly. This winter I shall visit Egypt, I think. The climate, they say, is superb. One will escape from the fogs, the grayness, the monotony of the constantly falling rain. Ah, Egypt, breathed Monsieur Blondin. One can even voyage there now, I believe, by train escaping all sea travel except the channel. Ah, the sea. It does not agree with you? Hercule Poirot shook his head and shuddered slightly. I, too, said Monsieur Blondin with sympathy. Curious the effect it has upon the stomach. But only upon certain stomachs. There are people on whom the motion makes no impression whatever. They actually enjoy it. An unfairness of the good God, said Monsieur Blondin. He shook his head sadly, and brooding on the impious thought, withdrew. Smooth-footed, deft-handed waiters ministered to the table. Toast Melba, butter, 
an ice pail, all the adjuncts to a meal of quality. The orchestra broke into an ecstasy of strange discordant noise. London danced. Hercule Poirot looked on, registering impressions in his neat, orderly mind. How bored and weary most of the faces were. Some of those stout men, however, were enjoying themselves, whereas a patient endurance seemed to be the sentiment exhibited on their partners' faces. The fat woman in purple was looking radiant. Undoubtedly, the fat had certain compensations in life. A zest, a gusto denied to those of more fashionable contours. A good sprinkling of young people, some vacant-looking, some bored. Some definitely unhappy. How absurd to call youth the time of happiness. Youth the time of greatest vulnerability. His glance softened as it rested on one particular couple. A well-matched pair. Tall, broad-shouldered man. Slender, delicate girl. Two bodies that moved in a perfect rhythm of happiness. Happiness in the place, the hour, and in each other. The dance stopped abruptly. Hands clapped and it started again. After a second encore, the couple returned to their table close by Poirot. The girl was flushed, laughing. As she sat, he could study her face as if it was lifted, laughing to her companion. There was something else beside laughter in her eyes. Hercule Poirot shook his head doubtfully. She cares too much, that little one, he said to himself. It is not safe. No, it is not safe. And then a word caught his ear. Egypt. Their voices came to him clearly. The girl was young, fresh, arrogant, with just a trace of soft-sounding foreign R's and the man's pleasant, low-toned, well-bred English. I'm not counting my chickens for their hatch, Simon. I tell you, Lynette won't let us down. I might let her down. Nonsense, it's just the right job for you. As a matter of fact, I think it is. I haven't really any doubts as to my capability, and I mean to make good for your sake. The girl laughed softly, a laugh of pure happiness. We'll wait three months to make sure you don't get the sack, and then... And then I'll endow thee with my worldly goods. That's the hang of it, isn't it? And as I say, we'll go to Egypt for our honeymoon. Damn the expense. I've always wanted to go to Egypt all my life. The Nile and the pyramids and the sand. He said, his voice slightly indistinct. We'll see it together, Jackie, together. Won't it be marvelous? I wonder, will it be as marvelous to you as it is to me? Do you really care as much as I do? Her voice was suddenly sharp, her eyes dilated almost with fear. The man's answer came with an equal sharpness. Don't be absurd, Jackie. The girl repeated. I wonder. Then she shrugged her shoulders. Let's dance. Hercule Poirot murmured to himself, Unki aimet unki se lai Yes, I wonder too. Section 7 Joanna Southwood said, And suppose he's a terrible tough. Lynette shook her head. Oh, he won't be. I can trust Jacqueline's taste. Joanna murmured, Ah, but don't people run true to form in love affairs? Lynette shook her head impatiently. Then she changed the subject. I must go and see Mr. Pierce about those plans. Plans? Yeah, some dreadful and sanitary old cottages. I'm having them pulled down and the people moved. How sanitary and public spirited of you, darling. They've had had to go away anyhow. Those cottages would have overlooked in my new swimming pool. Do the people who live in them like going? Most of them are delighted. One or two are being rather stupid about it. Really tiresome, in fact. 
They don't seem to realize how vastly improved their living conditions will be. But you're being quite high-handed about it, I presume. My dear Joanna, that's to their advantage, really. Yes, my dear, I'm sure it is. Compulsory benefit. Lynette frowned. Joanna laughed. Come now, you are a tyrant. Admit it. A beneficent tyrant, if you like. I'm not the least bit a tyrant. Might you like your own way? Not especially. Lynette Ridgeway, you can look me in the face and tell me of any one occasion on which you failed to do exactly as you wanted. Heaps of times. Oh, yes. Heaps of times. Just like that, but no concrete example. And you simply can't think up one, darling, however hard you try. The triumphal progress of Lynette Ridgeway and her golden god. Lynette said sharply, You think I'm selfish? No, just irresistible. The combined effect of money and charm. Everything goes down before you. What you can't buy with cash, you buy with a smile. Result, Lynette Ridgeway, the girl who has everything. Don't be ridiculous, Joanna. Well, haven't you got everything? I suppose I have. It sounds rather disgusting, somehow. Of course it's disgusting, darling. You'll probably get terribly bored and blasé by and by. In the meantime, enjoy the triumphal progress in the golden car. Only I wonder, I really do wonder, what will happen when you want to go down a street which has a board up saying, No Thoroughfare. Don't be idiotic, Joanna. As Lord Windlesham joined them, Lynette said, turning to him, Joanna is saying the nastiest things to me. Oh, spite, said Joanna vaguely as she got up from her seat. She made no apology for leaving them. She had caught the glint in Windlesham's eye. He was silent for a minute or two, then he went straight to the point. Have you come to a decision, Lynette? Lynette said slowly. Am I being a brute? I suppose, if I'm not sure, I ought to say no. He interrupted her. Don't say it. You shall have time, as much time as you want, but I think, you know, and we should be happy together. You see, Lynette's tone was apologetic, almost childish. I'm enjoying myself so much, especially with all this. She waved a hand. I wanted to make Ward Hall into my real ideal of a country house, and I do think I've got it nice. Don't you? It's beautiful, beautifully planned, everything perfect. You're very clever, Lynette. He paused a minute and went on. And you like Charltonbury, don't you? Of course, it wants modernizing and all that, but you were so clever at that sort of thing, you'd enjoy it. Why, of course, Charltonbury's divine. She spoke with a ready enthusiasm, but in her release she was conscious of a sudden chill. An alien note had sounded, disturbing her complete satisfaction with life. She did not analyze the feeling at the moment, but later, when Windlesham had gone into the house, she tried to probe into the recesses of her mind. Charltonbury. Yes, that was it. She had resented the mention of Charltonbury. Why? Charlesbury was modestly famous. Windlesham's ancestors had held it since the time of Elizabeth. To be mistress of Charlesbury was a position unsurpassed in society. Windlesham was one of the most desirable parties in England. Naturally, he wouldn't take Woad seriously. It was not in any way to be compared with Charlesbury. Ah, but Woad was hers. She had seen it, acquired it, rebuilt it, and redressed it lavished money on it. It was her own possession, her kingdom. But in a sense, it wouldn't count if she married Windlesham. What would they want with two country places? And of the two, naturally, Woad all would be the one to be given up. She and Lynette Ridgway wouldn't exist any longer. She would be Countess Windlesham, bringing a fine dowry to Charlenbury and its master. She would be Queen Consort, not Queen any longer. I'm being ridiculous, 
said Lynette to herself, but it was curious how she did hate the idea of abandoning Wood. And wasn't there something else nagging at her? Jackie's voice, with that queer, blurred note in it, saying, If I don't marry him, I'll die. I shall die, I shall die. So positive, so earnest. Did she, Lynette, feel that way about Windlesham? Assuredly, she didn't. Perhaps she could never feel like that about anyone. It must be rather wonderful to feel like that. The sound of a car came through the open window. Lynette shook herself impatiently. That must be Jackie and her young man. She'd go out and meet them. She was standing in the open doorway as Jacqueline and Simon Doyle got out of the car. Lynette! Jackie ran to her. This is Simon. Simon, here's Lynette. She's just the most wonderful person in the world. Lynette saw a tall, broad-shouldered young man with very dark blue eyes, crisply curling brown hair, a square chin, and a boyish, appealing, simple smile. She stretched out a hand. The hand that clasped hers was firm and warm. She liked the way he looked at her, the naive, genuine admiration. Jackie had told him she was wonderful, and he clearly thought that she was wonderful. A warm, sweet feeling of intoxication ran through her veins. Isn't this all lovely? she said. Come in, Simon, and let me welcome my new land agent properly. And as she turned to lead the way, she thought, I'm frightfully, frightfully happy. I like Jackie's young man. I like him enormously. And then with a sudden pang, Lucky Jackie. Section 8 Tim Allerton leant back in his wicker chair and yawned as he looked out over the sea. He shot a quick, sidelong glance at his mother. Mrs. Allerton was a good-looking, white-haired woman of fifty. By imparting an expression of pinched severity to her mouth every time she looked at her son, she sought to disguise the fact of her intense affection for him. Even total strangers were seldom deceived by this device, and Tim himself saw it through perfectly. He said, Do you really like Majorca, Mother? Well, Mrs. Allerton considered, it's cheap and cold, said Tim with a slight shiver. He was a tall, thin young man with dark hair and a rather narrow chest. His mouth had a very sweet expression. His eyes were sad and his chin was indecisive. He had long, delicate hands. Threatened by consumption some years ago, he had never displayed a really robust physique. He was popularly supposed to write, but it was understood among his friends that inquiries as to literary output were not encouraged. What are you thinking of, Tim? Mrs. Allerton was alert. Her bright, dark brown eyes looked suspicious. Tim Allerton grinned at her. I was thinking of Egypt. Egypt? Mrs. Allerton sounded doubtful. Real warmth, darling. Lazy golden sands. The Nile. I'd like to go up the Nile, wouldn't you? Oh, I'd like it. Her tone was dry. But Egypt's expensive, my dear. Not for those who have to count the pennies. Tim laughed. He rose, stretched himself. Suddenly he looked alive and eager. There was an excited note in his voice. The expense will be my affair. Yes, darling, a little flutter on the stock exchange. With thoroughly satisfactory results, I heard this morning. This morning? said Mrs. Ellerton sharply. You only had one letter, and that... She stopped and bit her lip. Tim looked momentarily undecided whether to be amused or annoyed. Amusement gained the day. And that was from Joanna, he finished coolly. Quite right, Mother. What a queen of detectives you'd make. The famous Hercule Poirot would have to look to his laurels if you were about. Mrs. Ellerton looked rather cross. I just happened to see the handwriting and knew it wasn't that of a stockbroker. Quite right. 
As a matter of fact, it was yesterday I heard from them. Poor Joanna's handwriting is rather noticeable. Sprawls about all over the envelope like an inebriated spider. What does Joanna say, anyway? Mrs. Allerton strove to make her voice sound casual and ordinary. The friendship between her son and his second cousin, Joanna Southwood, always irritated her. Not, as she put it to herself, that there was anything in it. She was quite sure there wasn't. Tim had never manifested a sentimental interest in Joanna, nor she in him. Their mutual attractions seemed to be founded on gossip, and the possession of a large number of friends and acquaintances in common. They both liked people and discussing people. Joanna had an amusing, if caustic, tongue. It was not because Mrs. Allerton feared that Tim might fall in love with Joanna that she found herself away becoming a little stiff in manner if Joanna were present or when letters from her arrived. It was some other feeling, hard to define, perhaps an unacknowledged jealousy in the unfeigned pleasure Tim always seemed to take in Joanna's society. He and his mother were such perfect companions that the sight of him absorbed and interested in another woman always startled Mrs. Allerton slightly. She fancied, too, that her own presence on these occasions set some barrier between the two members of the younger generation. Often she had come upon them eagerly absorbed in some conversation, and at sight of her their talk had wavered. It seemed to include her rather too purposefully, and as in duty bound. Quite definitely, Mrs. Allerton did not like Joanna Southwood. She thought her insincere, affected, and essentially superficial. She found it very hard to prevent herself saying so in unmeasured tones. In answer to her question, Tim pulled the letter out of his pocket and glanced through it. It was quite a long letter, his mother noted. Nothing much, he said. The Devonishes are getting a divorce. Old Monty's been had up for being drunk in charge of a car. Windlesham's gone to Canada. Seems he was pretty badly hit when Lynette Ridgway turned him down. She's definitely going to marry this land agent person. How extraordinary. Is he very dreadful? No, no, not at all. He's one of the Devonshire Doyles. No money, of course. And he was actually engaged to one of Lynette's best friends. Pretty thick, that. I don't think it's at all nice, said Mrs. Allerton, flushing. Tim flashed her a quick, affectionate glance. I know, darling, you don't approve of saffling other people's husbands and all that sort of thing. In my day we had our standards, said Mrs. Allerton, and a very good thing, too. Nowadays young people seem to think that they can just go about doing anything they choose. Tim smiled. They don't only think it. They do it. Vide, Lynette Ridgeway. Well, I think it's horrid. Tim twinkled at her. Cheer up, you old diehard. Perhaps I agree with you. Anyway, I haven't helped myself to anyone's wife or fiancé yet. I'm sure you'd never do such a thing, said Mrs. Ellerton. She added with spirit, I brought you up properly. So the credit is yours, not mine? He smiled teasingly at her as he folded the letter and put it away again. Mrs. Allerton let the thought just flash across her mind. Most letters he shows to me. He only gives me snippets from Joanna's. But she put the unworthy thought away from her and decided, as ever, to behave like a gentlewoman. Is Joanna enjoying life? she asked. So, so. Says she thinks of opening a delicatessen shop in Mayfair. She always talks about being hard up, said Mrs. Ellerton with a tinge of spite. But she goes about everywhere, and her clothes must cost her a lot. She's always beautifully dressed. Ah, well. She probably doesn't pay for them. No, Mother, I don't mean what your Edwardian mind suggests to you. I just mean quite literally that she leaves her bills unpaid. Mrs. Allerton sighed. I never know how people manage to do that. That's kind of a special gift, said Tim. If only you have sufficiently extravagant tastes and absolutely no sense of money values, people will give you any amount of credit. 
Yes, but you come to the bankruptcy court in the end, like poor Sir George Wode. You have a soft spot for that old horoscoper, probably because he called you a rosebud in 1879 at a dance. I wasn't born in 1879, Mrs. Allerton retorted with spirit. Sir George has charming manners, and I won't have you calling him a horoscoper. I've heard funny stories about him from people that know. You and Joanna don't mind what you say about people. Anything will do so long as it's sufficiently ill-natured. Tim raised his eyebrows. My dear, you're quite heated. I didn't know Old Wode was such a favorite of yours. You don't realize how hard it is for him having to sell Wode Hall. He cared terribly about that place. Tim suppressed the easy retort. After all, who was he to judge? Instead, he thought, sad, said thoughtfully, You know, I think you're not far wrong there. Lynette asked him to come down and see what she'd done to the place, and he refused quite rudely. Of course, she ought to have known better than to ask him. And I believe he's quite venomous about her. Mutters things under his breath whenever he sees her. Can't forgive her for having given him an absolutely top price for the worm-eaten family estate. And you can't understand that, Mrs. Allerton spoke sharply. Frankly, said Tim calmly, I can't. Why live in the past? Why cling on to things that have been? What are you going to put in their place? He shrugged his shoulders. Excitement, perhaps. Novelty. The joy of never knowing what may turn up from day to day. Instead of inheriting a useless tract of land, the pleasure of making money for yourself by your own brains and skill. A successful deal on the stock exchange, in fact. He laughed. Why not? And what about an equal loss on the stock exchange? That, dear, is rather tactless and quite inappropriate today. What about this Egypt plan? Well... He cut in, smiling at her. That's settled. We both always wanted to see Egypt. When do you suggest? Oh, next month. January is about the best time there. We'll enjoy the delightful society in this hotel a few weeks longer. Tim, said Mrs. Allerton reproachfully. Then she added guiltily, I'm afraid I promised Mrs. Leach that you'd go with her to the police station. She doesn't understand any Spanish. Tim made a grimace. About her ring, the blood-red ruby of the horse leech's daughter. Does she still persist in thinking it's been stolen? I'll go if you like, but it's a waste of time. She'll only get some wretched chambermaid into trouble. I distinctly saw it on her finger when she went into the sea that day. It came off in the water, and she never noticed. She says she's quite sure she took it off and left it on her dressing table. Well, she didn't. I saw it with my own eyes. The woman's a fool. Any woman's a fool who goes prancing into the sea in December, pretending the water's quite warm, just because the sun happens to be shining rather brightly at the moment. Stout women oughtn't to be allowed to bathe anyway. They look so revolting in bathing dresses. Mrs. Allerton murmured, I really feel I ought to give up bathing. Tim gave a shout of laughter. You... You can give most of the young things points in despair. Mrs. Allerton sighed and said, I wish there were a few more young people for you here. Tim Allerton shook his head decidedly. I don't. You and I get along rather comfortably without outside distractions. You'd like it if Joanna were here. I wouldn't. His tone was unexpectedly resolute. You're all wrong there. Joanna amuses me, but I don't really like her. And to have her around much gets on my nerves. I'm thankful she isn't here. I should be quite resigned if I were never to see Joanna again. He added, almost below his breath, There's only one woman in the world I've got a real respect and admiration for. And I think, Mrs. Allerton, you know very well who that woman is. His mother blushed and looked quite confused. Tim said gravely, There aren't very many really nice women in the world. You happen to be one of them. Section 9 In an apartment overlooking Central Park in New York, 
Mrs. Robson exclaimed. If that isn't just too lovely, you really are the luckiest girl, Cornelia. Cornelia Robson flushed responsively. She was a big, clumsy-looking girl with brown, dog-like eyes. Oh, it will be wonderful, she gasped. Old Miss Van Schuyler inclined her head in a satisfied fashion at this correct attitude on the part of poor relations. I've always dreamed of a trip to Europe, sighed Cornelia, but I just didn't feel I'd ever get there. Miss Bowers will come with me as usual, of course, said Miss Van Schuyler, but as a social companion I find her limited, very limited. There are many little things that Cornelia can do for me. I just love to, Cousin Murray said Cornelia eagerly. Well, well, then that's settled, said Miss Van Schuyler. Just run and find Miss Bowers, my dear. Time for my eggnog. Cornelia departed. Her mother said, My dear Marie, I'm really most grateful to you. You know, I think Cornelia suffers a lot from not being a social success. It makes her feel kind of mortified if I could afford to take her to places, but you know how it's been since Ned died. I'm very glad to take her, said Miss Van Schuyler. Cornelia has always been a nice, handy girl, willing to run errands and not so selfish as some of these young people nowadays. Mrs. Robson rose and kissed her rich relative's wrinkled and slightly yellow face. I'm just ever so grateful, she declared. On the stairs she met a tall, capable-looking woman who was carrying a glass containing a yellow, foamy liquid. Well, Miss Bower, so you're off to Europe. Why, yes, Mrs. Robson. What a lovely trip. Why, yes, I should think it would be very enjoyable. But you've been abroad before. Oh, yes, Mrs. Robson. I went over to Paris with Miss Van Schuyler last fall, but I've never been to Egypt before. Mrs. Robson hesitated. I do hope there won't be any trouble. She had lowered her voice. Miss Bowers, however, replied in her usual tone, Oh no, Mrs. Robson, I shall take good care of that. I keep a very sharp lookout, always. But there was still a faint shadow on Mrs. Robson's face as she slowly continued down the stairs. Section 10 In his office downtown, Mr. Andrew Pennington was opening his personal mail. Suddenly his fist clenched itself and came down on his desk with a bang. His face crimsoned and two big veins stood out on his forehead. He pressed a buzzer on his desk and a smart-looking stenographer appeared with commendable promptitude. Tell Mr. Rockford to step in here. Yes, Mr. Pennington. A few minutes later, Sterndale Rockford, Pennington's partner, entered the office. The two men were not unlike, both tall, spare, with gray hair and clean-shaven, clever faces. What's up, Pennington? Pennington looked up from the letter he was rereading. He said, Lynette's married. What? You heard what I said. Lynette Ridgeway's married. How? When? Why didn't we hear about it? Pennington glanced at the calendar on his desk. She wasn't married when she wrote this letter, but she's married now, morning of the 4th. That's today. Rockford dropped into a chair. Whew. No warning, nothing. Who's the man? Pennington referred again to the letter. Doyle, Simon Doyle. What sort of a fellow is he? Ever heard of him? No, he doesn't say much. He scanned the lines of clear, upright handwriting. Got an idea there's something hole and corner about the business. It doesn't matter, the whole point is she's married. The eyes of the two men met. Rockford nodded. That needs a bit of thinking about, he said quietly. What are we going to do about it? I'm asking you. The two men sat silent. Then Rockford said, Got any plan? Pennington said slowly, The Normandy sails today. One of us could just make it. You're crazy. What's the big idea? Pennington said, Those British lawyers and stopped. What about him? Surely you're not going over to tackle him. You're mad. I'm not suggesting you or I should go to England. What's the big idea, then? Pennington smoothed out the letter on the table. 
Lynette's going to Egypt for her honeymoon. She expects to be there a month or more. Egypt, eh? Rockford considered, then looked up and met the other's glance. Egypt, that's your idea? Yes, a chance meeting over on a trip. Lynette and her husband, honeymoon atmosphere. It might be done. Rockford said doubtfully. She's sharp, Lynette is, but... Pennington said softly. I think there might be ways of managing it. Again, their eyes met. Rockford nodded. All right, big boy. Pennington looked at the clock. We'll have to hustle whichever of us is going. You go, said Rockford promptly. You always made a hit with Lynette. Uncle Andrew, that's the ticket. Pennington's face had hardened. He said, I hope I can pull it off, his partner said. You've got to pull it off. The situation's critical. Section 11 William Carmichael said to the thin, weedy youth who opened the door inquiringly, Send Mr. Jim to me, please. Jim Van Thorpe entered the room and looked inquiringly at his uncle. The older man looked up with a nod and a grunt. Humph! There you are. You asked for me. Just cast an eye over this. The young man sat down and drew the sheaf of papers toward him. The elder man watched him. Well? The answer came promptly. Looks fishy to me, sir. Again, the senior partner of Carmichael, Grant and Carmichael, uttered his characteristic grunt. Jim Van Thorpe reread the letter which had just arrived by airmail from Egypt. It seems wicked to be writing business letters on such a day. We have spent a week at Mena House and made an expedition to the Fayum. The day after tomorrow we're going up the Nile to Luxor and Aswan by steamer, and perhaps on to Khartoum. When we went into Cook's this morning to see about the tickets, who do you think was the first person I saw? My American trustee, Andrew Pennington. I think you met him two years ago when he was over. I had no idea he was in Egypt, and he had no idea that I was, nor that I was married. My letter telling of a marriage must have just missed him. He's actually going up the Nile on the same trip that we are. Isn't it a coincidence? Thank you so much for all you've done in this busy time. I... As the young man was about to turn the page, Mr. Carmichael took the letter from him. That's all, he said. The rest doesn't matter. Well, what do you think? His nephew considered for a moment, then he said, Well, I think not a coincidence. The other nodded approval. Like a trip to Egypt, he barked out. You think that's advisable? I think there's no time to lose. But why me? Use your brains, boy, use your brains. The Net Ridgeway has never met you, no more than Pennington. If you go by air, you may get there in time. I, I don't like it, sir. What am I to do? Use your eyes, use your ears, use your brains if you've got any. And if necessary, act. I, I don't like it. Perhaps not, but you've got to do it. It's necessary? In my opinion, said Mr. Carmichael, it's absolutely vital. Section 12 Mrs. Otterborn, readjusting the turban of native material that she wore draped round her head, said fretfully, I really don't see why we shouldn't go on to Egypt. I'm sick and tired of Jerusalem. As her daughter made no reply, she said, You might at least answer when you're spoken to. Rosalie Otterborn was looking at a newspaper reproduction of a face. Below it was written, Mrs. Simon Doyle, who before her marriage was the well-known society beauty Miss Lynette Ridgway. Mr. and Mrs. Doyle are spending their honeymoon in Egypt. Rosalie said, You'd like to move on to Egypt, Mother? Yes, I would, Mrs. Otterborn snapped. I consider they treated us in a most cavalier fashion here. My being here is an advertisement. I ought to get a special reduction in terms. When I hinted as much, I consider they were most impertinent, a most impertinent. I told them exactly what I thought of them. The girl sighed. She said, 
One place is very like another. I wish we could get right away. And this morning, went on Mrs. Otterborn, the manager actually had the impertinence to tell me that all the rooms had been booked in advance, and that it would require ours in two days' time. So we've got to go somewhere. Not at all. I'm quite prepared to fight for my rights, Rosalie murmured. I suppose we might as well go on to Egypt. It doesn't make any difference. It's certainly not a matter of life or death, said Mrs. Otterborn. But there she was quite wrong, for a matter of life and death was exactly what it was. Part 2. Egypt. Chapter 1. That's Hercule Poirot, the detective, said Mrs. Otterton. She and her son were sitting in brightly painted scarlet basket chairs outside the Cataract Hotel at Aswan. They were watching the retreating figures of two people, a short man dressed in a white silk suit, and a tall, slim girl. Tim Allerton sat up in an unusual alert fashion. That funny little man, he asked incredulously. That funny little man, Tim said. What on earth's he doing out here? His mother laughed. Darling, you sound quite excited. Why do men enjoy crime so much? I hate detective stories and never read them. But I don't think Mojo Poro is here with any ulterior motive. He's made a good deal of money and he's seeing life, I fancy. Seems to have an eye for the best-looking girl in the place. Mrs. Allerton tilted her head a little on one side as she considered the retreating backs of Mojo Poro and his companion. The girl by his side overtopped him by some three inches. She walked well, neither stiffly nor slouchingly. I suppose she is quite good-looking, said Mrs. Allerton. She shot a little glance sideways at Tim. Somewhat to her amusement, the fish rose at once. She's more than quiet. Pity she looks so bad-tempered and sulky. Perhaps that's just expression, dear. Unpleasant young devil, I think, but she's pretty enough. The subject of these remarks was walking slowly by Boiro's side. Rosalie Otterborn was twirling an unopened parasol, and her expression certainly bore out what Tim had just said. She looked both sulky and bad-tempered. Her eyebrows were drawn together in a frown, and the scarlet line of her mouth was drawn downwards. They turned to the left out of the hotel gate and into the cool shade of the public gardens. Hercule Poirot was prattling gently, his expression that of beatific good humor. He wore a white silk suit, carefully pressed, a Panama hat, and carried a highly ornamental fly-whisk with a sham amber handle. It enchants me, he was saying, the black rocks of Elephantine, and the sun, the little boats on the river. Yes, it is good to be alive. He paused and then added, You do not find it so, mademoiselle? Rosalie Otterborn said shortly, it's all right, I suppose. I think Aswan's a gloomy sort of place. The hotel's half empty, and everyone's about a hundred. She stopped, biting her lip. Hercule Poirot's eyes twinkled. It is true, yes. I have one leg in the grave. I wasn't thinking of you, said the girl. I'm sorry, that sounded rude. Not at all. It is natural that you should wish for young companions of your own age. Ah, well, there is one young man, at least. The one who sits with his mother all the time. I like her, but I think he looks dreadful. So conceited. Poirot smiled. And I? Am I conceited? No, I don't think so. She was obviously uninterested, but the fact did not seem to annoy Poirot. He merely remarked with placid satisfaction. My best friend says that I am very conceited. Oh, well, said Rosalie vaguely. I suppose you have something to be conceited about. Unfortunately, crime doesn't interest me in the least. Poro said solemnly. I am delighted to learn that you have no guilty secret to hide. Just for a moment, the sulky mask of her face was transformed as she sought him a swift, questioning glance. Poirot did not seem to notice it as he went on. 
madame. Your mother was not at lunch today. She is not indisposed, I trust. This place doesn't suit her, said Rosalie briefly. I shall be glad when we leave. We are fellow passengers, are we not? We both make the excursion up to the Wadi Haifa and the second cataract? Yes. They came out from the shade of the garden onto a dusty stretch of road bordered by the river. Five watchful bead sellers, two vendors of postcards, three sellers of plaster scarabs, a couple of donkey boys, and some detached but hopeful infantile riffraff closed in upon them. You want beads, sir? Very good, sir. Very cheap. Hey, you want scarab? Look, great queen. Very lucky. You look, sir, real lapis. Very good. Very cheap. You want the right donkey, sir? This very good donkey. This donkey whiskey and soda, sir. You want to go granite quarry, sir? This very good donkey. Other donkey very bad, sir. That donkey fall down. You want postcard? Very cheap. Very nice. Look, lady, only ten piastres. Very cheap lapis. This ivory. This very good fly whisk. That's all amber. You go out in boat, sir. I got very good boat, sir. You ride back to hotel, lady. This first class donkey. Hercule Poirot made vague gestures to rid himself of this human cluster of flies. Rosalie stalked through them like a sleepwalker. It's best to pretend to be deaf and blind, she remarked. The infantile riffraff ran alongside, murmuring plaintively. Bakshish? Bakshish? Hip hip. Hurrah! Very good. Very nice. Their gaily colored rags trailed picturesquely, and the flies lay in clusters on their eyelids. They were the most persistent. The others fell back and launched a fresh attack on the next corner. Now Boro and Rosalie only ran the gauntlet of the shops. Suave, persuasive accents here. You visit my shop today, sir. You want that ivory crocodile, sir. You not been in my shop yet, sir. I show you very beautiful things. They turned into the fifth shop and Rosalie handed over several rolls of films, the object of the walk. Then they came out again and walked toward the river's edge. One of the Nile steamers was just mooring. Poro and Rosalie looked interestedly at the passengers. Quite a lot, aren't there? commented Rosalie. She turned her head as Tim Allerton came up and joined them. He was a little out of breath, as though he had been walking fast. They stood there for a moment or two, and then Tim spoke. An awful crowd, as usual, I suppose, he remarked disparagingly, indicating the disembarking passengers. Uh, usually quite terrible, agreed Rosalie. All three wore the air of superiority assumed by people who are already in a place when studying new arrivals. Hello, said Tim, his voice suddenly excited. I'm damned if that isn't Lynette Ridgeway. If the information left Poirot unmoved, it stirred Rosalie's interest. She leaned forward, and her sulkiness quite dropped from her as she asked, Where? At one in white? Yes, there was a tall man. They're coming ashore now. He's the new husband, I suppose. Can't remember her name now. Doyle, said Rosalie. Simon Doyle. It was in all the newspapers. She's simply rolling, isn't she? Only about the richest girl in England, said Tim cheerfully. The three lookers-on were silent, watching the passengers come ashore. Poirot gazed with interest at the subject of the remarks of his companions. He murmured, She is beautiful. Some people have got everything, said Rosalie bitterly. There was a queer, grudging expression on her face as she watched the other girl come up the gangplank. Lynette Doyle was looking as perfectly turned out as if she was stepping on the center of the stage in a review. She had something, too, of the assurance of a famous actress. She was used to being looked at, to being admired, to being the center of the stage wherever she went. She was aware of the keen glances bent upon her, and at the same time almost unaware of them. Such tributes were part of her life. She came ashore playing a role, even though she played it unconsciously. The rich, beautiful society bride on her honeymoon. 
She turned with a little smile and light remark to the tall man by her side. He answered, and the sound of his voice seemed to interest Hercule Poirot. His eyes lit up, and he drew his brows together. A couple passed close to him. He heard Simon Doyle say, We'll try and make time for it, darling. We can easily stay a week or two if you like it here. His face was turned towards her, eager, adoring, a little humble. Poirot's eyes ran over him thoughtfully. The square shoulders, the bronzed face, the dark blue eyes, the rather childlike simplicity of the smile. Lucky devil, said Tim after they had passed. Fancy finding an heiress who hasn't got adenoids and flat feet. They look frightfully happy, said Rosalie with a note of envy in her voice. She said suddenly, but so low that Tim did not catch the words, it isn't fair. Poirot heard, however. He had been frowning somewhat perplexedly, but now he flashed a quick glance towards her. Tim said, I must collect some stuff for my mother now. He raised his hat and moved off. Poirot and Rosalie retraced their steps slowly in the direction of the hotel, waving aside fresh proffers of donkeys. So it is not fair, mademoiselle, said Poirot gently. The girl flushed angrily. I don't know what you mean. I am repeating what you said just now, under your breath. Oh, yes, you did. Rosalie Otterborn shrugged her shoulders. It really seems a little too much for one person. Money, good looks, marvelous figure, and... She paused, and Poirot said, And love, eh? And love? But you do not know. She may have been married for her money. Didn't you see the way he looked at her? Oh, yes, mademoiselle, I saw all there was to see. Indeed, I saw something that you did not. What was that? Poirot said slowly. I saw mademoiselle dark lined below a woman's eyes. I saw a hand that clutched a sunshade so tight that the knuckles were white. Rosalie was staring at him. What do you mean? I mean that all is not the gold that glitters. I mean that though the lady is rich and beautiful and beloved, there is all the same something that is not right, and I know something else. Yes, I know, said Poro frowning, that somewhere, at some time, I have heard that voice before, the voice of Bonjour Doyle, and I wish I could remember where. But Rosalie was not listening. She had stopped dead. With the point of her sunshade, she was tracing patterns on the loose sand. Suddenly, she broke out fiercely. I'm odious. I'm quite odious. I'm just a beast through and through. I'd like to tear the clothes off her back and stamp on her lovely, arrogant, self-confident face. I'm just a jealous cat. But that's what I feel like. She's so horribly successful and poised and assured. Hercule Poirot looked a little astonished by the outburst. He took her by the arm and gave her a friendly little shake. Tenez, you will feel better for having said that. I just hate her. I've never hated anyone so much at first sight. Magnificent. Rosalie looked at him doubtfully. Then her mouth twitched, and she laughed. Bien, said Poirot, and laughed too. They proceeded amicably back to the hotel. I must find mother, said Rosalie as they came into the cool dim hall. Poirot passed out on the other side onto the terrace overlooking the Nile. Here were little tables set for tea, but it was early still. He stood for a few moments looking down onto the river, then strolled down through the gardens. Some people were playing tennis in the hot sun. He paused to watch them for a while, then went on down the steep path. It was there, sitting on a bench overlooking the Nile, that he came upon the girl of Chemetan. He recognized her at once. Her face, as he had seen it that night, was securely etched upon his memory. The expression on it now was very different. She was paler, thinner, and there were lines that told of a great weariness and misery of spirit. 
he drew back a little. She had not seen him, and he watched her for a while without her suspecting his presence. Her small foot tapped impatiently on the ground. Her eyes, dark with a kind of smoldering fire, had a queer kind of suffering, dark triumph in them. She was looking out across the Nile, where the white-sailed boats glided up and down the river. A face and a voice. He remembered them both. This girl's face and the voice he had heard just now. The voice of a newly made bridegroom. And even as he stood there considering the unconscious girl, the next scene in the drama was played. Voices sounded above. The girl on the seat started to her feet. Lynette Doyle and her husband came down the path. Lynette's voice was happy and confident. The look of strain and tenseness of muscle had quite disappeared. Lynette was happy. The girl who was standing there took a step or two forward. The other two stopped dead. Hello, Lynette, said Jacqueline de Belfort. So here you are. We never seem to stop running into each other. Hello, Simon. How are you? Lynette Doyle had shrunk back against the rock with a little cry. Simon Doyle's good-looking face was suddenly convulsed with rage. He moved forward as though he would have liked to strike the slim, girlish figure. With a quick, bird-like turn of her head, she signaled her realization of a stranger's presence. Simon turned his head and noticed Poirot. He said awkwardly, Hello, Jacqueline. Uh, we didn't expect to see you here. The words were unconvincing in the extreme. The girl flashed white teeth at them. Quite a surprise, she asked. Then, with a little nod, she walked up the path. Poirot moved delicately in the opposite direction. As he went, he heard Lynette Doyle say, Simon, for God's sake, Simon, what can we do? Chapter 2 Dinner was over. The terrace outside the Cataract Hotel was softly lit. Most of the guests staying at the hotel were there sitting at little tables. Simon and Lynette Doyle came out, a tall, distinguished-looking, gray-haired man with a keen, clean-shaven American face beside them. As the little group hesitated for a moment in the doorway, Tim Allerton rose from his chair nearby and came forward. "'You don't remember me, I'm sure.' he said pleasantly to Lynette, but I'm Joanna Southwood's cousin. Of course, how stupid of me. You're Tim Allerton. This is my husband. A faint tremor in the voice, pride, shyness. And this is my American trustee, Mr. Bennington. Tim said, you must meet my mother. A few minutes later they were sitting together in a party, Lynette in the corner, Tim and Pennington each side of her, both talking to her, vying for her attention, Mrs. Allerton talking to Simon Doyle. The swing doors revolved. A sudden tension came into the beautiful upright figure sitting in the corner between the two men. Then it relaxed as a small man came out and walked across the terrace. Mrs. Allerton said, You're not the only celebrity here, my dear. That funny little man is Hercule Poirot. She had spoken lightly, just out of instinctive social tact to bridge an awkward pause, but Lynette seemed struck by the information. Hercule Poirot? Of course. I've heard of him. She seemed to sink into a fit of abstraction. The two men on either side of her were momentarily at a loss. Poirot had strolled across to the edge of the terrace, but his attention was immediately solicited. Sit down, Monjo Boro. What a lovely night. He obeyed. May we, madame? It is indeed beautiful. He smiled politely at Mrs. Otterborn. What draperies of black ninon and that ridiculous turban effect. Mrs. Otterborn went on in her high, complaining voice. Quite a lot of notabilities here now, aren't there? I expect we shall see a paragraph about it in the papers soon. Society Beauties, famous novelist. She paused with a slight mock modest laugh. Poirot felt, rather than saw, the sulky frowning girl opposite him flinch and set her mouth in a sulkier line than before. 
You have a novel on the way at present, madame? he inquired. Mrs. Otterborne gave her little self-conscious laugh again. I'm being dreadfully lazy. I really must set to. My public is getting terribly impatient, and my publisher, poor man, appeals by every post, even cables. Again he felt the girl shift in the darkness. I don't mind telling you, Monsieur Poirot, I'm here partly for the local color. Snow on the Desert's Face. That is the title of my new book. Powerful. Suggestive. Snow on the Desert. Melted in the first flame and breath of passion. Rosalie got up, muttering something, and moved away down into the dark garden. One must be strong, went on Mrs. Otterborn, wagging the turban emphatically. Strong meat. That is what my books are. Libraries may ban them. No matter, I speak the truth. Sex. Ah, Mojo Poro, why is everyone so afraid of sex? The pivot of the universe. You have read my books? Alas, madame, you comprehend I do not read many novels. My work? Mrs. Otterborn said firmly. I must give you a copy of Under the Fig Tree. I think you will find it significant. It is outspoken, but it is real. That is most kind of you, madame. I will read it with pleasure. Mrs. Otterborn was silent a minute or two. She fidgeted with a long chain of beads that was wound twice round her neck. She looked swiftly from side to side. Perhaps I'll just slip up and get it for you now. Oh, madame, pray do not trouble yourself. Later. No, no, it's no trouble, she rose. I'd like to show you. What is it, mother? Rosalie was suddenly at her side. Nothing, dear. I was just going up to get a book from Mujo Baro. The fig tree? I'll get it. You don't know where it is, my dear. I'll go. Yes, I do. The girl went swiftly across the terrace into the hotel. Let me congratulate you, madame, on a very lovely daughter, said Poirot with a bow. Rosalie? Yes. Yes, she is good-looking, but she's very hard, Monsieur Poirot, and no sympathy with illness. She always thinks she knows best. She imagines she knows more about my health than I do myself. Poirot signaled to a passing waiter. A liqueur, madame? A chartreuse, a crème de men. Mrs. Otterborn shook her head vigorously. No, no, I'm practically a teetotaler. You may have noticed I never drink anything but water, or perhaps lemonade. I cannot bear the taste of spirits. Then may I order you a lemon squash, madame? He gave the order. One lemon squash and one benedictine. The swing door revolved. Rosalie passed through and came towards them, a book in her hand. Here you are, she said. Her voice was quite expressionless, almost remarkably so. Monsieur Poirot has just ordered me a lemon squash, said her mother. And you, mademoiselle, what will you take? Nothing, she added, suddenly conscious of the curtness. Nothing, thank you. Poirot took the volume which Mrs. Otterborn held out to him. It still bore its original jacket, a gaily colored affair representing a lady with smartly shingled hair and scarlet fingernails sitting on a tiger skin in the traditional costume of Eve. Above her was a tree with the leaves of an oak bearing large and improbably colored apples. It was entitled Under the Fig Tree by Salome Otterborn. On the inside was a publisher's blurb. It spoke enthusiastically of the superb courage and realism of this study of a modern woman's love life. Fearless, unconventional, realistic, were the adjectives used. Poirot bowed and murmured. I am honored, madame. As he raised his head, his eyes met those of the authoress's daughter. Almost involuntarily he made a little movement. He was astonished and grieved at the eloquent pain they revealed. It was at that moment that the drinks arrived and created a welcome diversion. Poro lifted his glass gallantly. A votre sante, madame, mademoiselle. 
Mrs. Otterborn, sipping lemonade, murmured, So refreshing. Delicious. Silence fell on the three of them. They looked down to the shining black rocks in the Nile. There was something fantastic about them in the moonlight. They were like vast prehistoric monsters lying half out of the water. A little breeze came up suddenly, and as suddenly, died away. There was a feeling in the air of hush, of expectancy. Hercule Poirot brought his gaze to the terrace and its occupants. Was he wrong, or was there the same hush of expectancy there? It was like a moment on the stage when one is waiting for the entrance of the leading lady. And just at that moment the swing doors began to revolve once more. This time it seemed as though they did so with a special air of importance. Everyone had stopped talking and was looking towards them. A dark, slender girl in a wine-colored evening frock came through. She paused for a minute, then walked deliberately across the terrace and sat down at an empty table. There was nothing flaunting, nothing out of the way about her demeanor, and yet it had somehow the studied effect of a stage entrance. Well, said Mrs. Otterborn. She tossed her turbaned head. She seems to think she's somebody, that girl. Poirot did not answer. He was watching. The girl had sat down in a place where she could look deliberately across at Lynette Doyle. Presently Poirot noticed Lynette Doyle leant forward and said something, and a moment later got up and changed her seat. She was now sitting facing in the opposite direction. Poirot nodded thoughtfully to himself. It was about five minutes later that the other girl changed her seat to the opposite side of the terrace. She sat smoking and smiling quietly, the picture of contented ease. But always, as though unconsciously, her meditative gaze was on Simon Doyle's wife. After a quarter of an hour, Lynette Doyle got up abruptly and went into the hotel. Her husband followed her almost immediately. Jacqueline de Belfort smiled and twisted her chair around. She lit a cigarette and stared out over the Nile. She went on smiling to herself. Chapter 3 Bonjour, Poirot. Poirot got hastily to his feet. He had remained sitting out on the terrace alone after everyone else had left. Lost in meditation, he had been staring at the smooth, shining black rocks when the sound of his name recalled him to himself. It was a well-bred, assured voice, a charming voice, although perhaps a trifle arrogant. Hercule Poirot, rising quickly, looked into the commanding eyes of Lynette Doyle. She wore a wrap of rich purple velvet over her white satin gown, and she looked more lovely and more regal than Poirot had imagined possible. "'You are Monjou Hercule Poirot?' said Lynette. It was hardly a question. "'At your service, madame. You know who I am, perhaps?' "'Yes, madame, I have heard your name. I know exactly who you are.' Lynette nodded. That was only what she had expected. She went on in her charming, autocratic manner. Will you come with me into the card room, Mojoboro? I am very anxious to speak to you. Certainly, madame. She led the way into the hotel. He followed. She led him into the deserted card room and motioned him to close the door. Then she sank down in a chair at one of the tables, and he sat down opposite her. She plunged straight away into what she wanted to say. There were no hesitations. Her speech came flowingly. I have heard a great deal about you, Mojoboro, and I know that you are a very clever man. It happens that I am urgently in need of someone to help me, and I think very possibly that you are the man who could do it. Poro inclined his head. You are very amiable, madame, but you see I am on holiday, and when I am on holiday I do not take cases. That could be arranged. It was not offensively said, only with the quiet confidence of a young woman who had always been able to arrange matters to her satisfaction. Lynette Doyle went on. I am the subject, Monjou Poirot, of an intolerable persecution. 
that persecution has got to stop. My own idea was to go to the police about it, but my, my husband seems to think that the police would be powerless to do anything. Perhaps if you would explain a little further, murmured Poro politely. Oh yes, I will do so. The matter is perfectly simple. There was still no hesitation, no faltering. Lynette Doyle had a clear-cut, business-like mind. She only paused a minute so as to present the facts as concisely as possible. Before I met my husband, he was engaged to Miss de Belfort. She was also a friend of mine. My husband broke off his engagement to her. I were not suited in any way. She, I am sorry to say, took it rather hard. I am very sorry about that, but these things cannot be helped. She made certain, well, threats, to which I paid very little attention, and which I may say she has not attempted to carry out, but instead she has adopted the extraordinary course of, of following us about wherever we go. Otto raised his eyebrows. Ah, rather an unusual revenge. Very unusual, and very ridiculous, but also annoying. She bit her lip. Poro nodded. Yes, I can imagine that. You are, I understand, on your honeymoon? Yes, it happened the first time at Venice. She was there at Daniele's. I thought it was just coincidence. Rather embarrassing, but that was all. Then we found her on board the boat at Brindisi. We, we understood that she was going on to Palestine. We left her as we thought of the boat. But, but when we got to Mena House, she was there, waiting for us. Poro nodded. And now, we came up the Nile by boat. I was half expecting to find her on board. When she wasn't there, I thought she had stopped being so... so childish. But when we got here, she was here, waiting. Poro eyed her keenly for a moment. She was still perfectly composed, but the knuckles of the hand that was gripping the table were white with the force of her grip. He said, And you are afraid this state of things may continue? Yes. Of course, the whole thing is idiotic. Jacqueline is making herself utterly ridiculous. I'm surprised she hasn't got more pride, more dignity. Poirot made a slight gesture. There are times, madame, when pride and dignity, they go by the board. There are other, stronger emotions. Yes, possibly. Lynette spoke impatiently. But what on earth can she hope to gain by all this? It is not always a question of gain, madame. Something in his tone struck Lynette disagreeably. She flushed and said quickly, You are right. The discussion of motives is beside the point. The crux of the matter is that this has got to be stopped. And how do you propose that that should be accomplished, madame? Poro asked. Well, naturally... My husband and I cannot continue being subjected to this annoyance. There must be some kind of legal redress against such a thing. She spoke impatiently. Poro looked at her thoughtfully as he asked, Has she threatened you in actual words in public? Used insulting language? Attempted any bodily harm? No. Then, frankly, madame, I do not see what you can do. If it is a young lady's pleasure to travel in certain places, and those places are the same where you and your husband find yourselves, eh bien, what of it? The air is free to all. There is no question of her forcing herself upon your privacy. It is always in public that these encounters take place. You mean there's nothing I can do about it? Lynette sounded incredulous. Poirot said placidly, Nothing at all as far as I can see. Mademoiselle de Belfort is within her rights. But, but it is maddening. It is intolerable. 
that I have to put up with this. Poirot said dryly, I sympathize with you, madame, especially as I imagine that you have not often had to put up with things. Lynette was frowning. There must be some way of stopping it, she murmured. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. You can always leave, move on somewhere else, he suggested. Then she will follow. Very possibly, yes. It's absurd. Precisely. Anyway, why should I, we, run away? And so, as though, she stopped. Exactly, madame. As though. It is all there, is it not? Lynette lifted her head and stared at him. What do you mean? Poro altered his tone. He leant forward. His voice was confidential, appealing. He said very gently, Why do you mind so much, madame? Why? But it's maddening, irritating to the last degree. I've told you why. Poirot shook his head. Not altogether. Lynette said again, What do you mean? Poirot leant back, folded his arms, and spoke in a detached, impersonal manner. A good day, madame. I will recount to you a little history. It is that one day a month or two ago, I am dining in a restaurant in London. At the table next to me are two people, a man and a girl. They are very happy, so it seems very much in love. They talk with confidence of the future. It is not that I listen to what is not meant for me. They are quite oblivious of who hears them and who does not. The man's back is to me, but I can watch the girl's face. It is very intense. She is in love, heart, soul, and body, and she is not of those who love lightly and often. With her it is clearly the life and the death. They are engaged to be married, these two, that is what I gather, and they talk of where they shall pass the days of their honeymoon. They plan to go to Egypt. He paused. Lynette said sharply, Well, Poro went on, that is a month or two ago, but the girl's face, I do not forget it. I know that I shall remember if I see it again, and I remember too the man's voice. And I think you can guess, madame, when it is I see the one and hear the other again. It is here in Egypt. The man is on his honeymoon, yes, but he is on his honeymoon with another woman. Lynette said sharply, What of it? I had already mentioned the facts. The facts, yes. Well then, Poirot said slowly, the girl in the restaurant mentioned a friend, a friend whom she was very positive would not let her down. That friend, I think, was you, madame. Lynette flushed. Yes, I told you we had been friends. And she trusted you. Yes. She hesitated for a moment, biting her lip impatiently. Then, as Poirot did not seem disposed to speak, she broke out. Of course, the whole thing was very unfortunate. These things happen, Mujo Poro. Ah, yes, they happen, madame. You are of the Church of England, I presume? Yes. Lynette looked slightly bewildered. Then you have heard portions of the Bible read aloud in church. You have heard of King David, and of the rich man who had many flocks and herds, and the poor man who had but one ewe lamb, and of how the rich man took the poor man's one ewe lamb, that was something that happened, madame. Lynette sat up. Her eyes flashed angrily. I see perfectly what you're driving at, Mojoporo. You think, to put it vulgarly, that I stole my friend's young man. Looking at the matter sentimentally, which is, I suppose, the way people of your generation cannot help looking at things, that is possibly true. But the real hard truth is different. I don't deny that Jackie was passionately in love with Simon, but I don't think you take into account that he may not have been equally devoted to her. He was very fond of her, but I think that even before he met me, he was beginning to feel that he had made a mistake. Look at it clearly, Mojoporo. Simon discovers that it is I he loves, not Jackie. What is he to do? He, heroically noble, and marry a woman he does not care for, and 
thereby probably ruin three lives, for it is doubtful whether you could make Jackie happy under these circumstances. If you were actually married to her when he met me, I agree that it might be his duty to stick to her, although I'm not really sure of that. If one person is unhappy, the other suffers too, but an engagement is not really binding. If a mistake has been made, then surely it is better to face the facts before it is too late. I admit it was very hard on Jackie, and I'm terribly sorry about it, but there it is. It was inevitable. I wonder, she stared at him, what do you mean? It is very sensible, very logical, all that you say, but it does not explain one thing. What is that? Your own attitude, madame. See you, this pursuit of you, you might take it in two ways. It might cause you annoyance, yes, or it might stir your pity. That your friend should have been so deeply hurt as to throw all regard for the conventions aside. But that is not the way you react. No, to you this persecution is intolerable. And why? It can be for one reason only. That you feel a sense of guilt. Lynette sprang to her feet. How dare you? Really, Mojoparo, this is going too far. But I do dare, madame. I am going to speak to you quite frankly. I suggest to you that, although you may have endeavored to gloss over the fact to yourself, you deliberately set about taking your husband from your friend. I suggest that you felt strongly attracted to him at once, but I suggest that there was a moment when you hesitated, when you realized that there was a choice, that you could refrain or go on. I suggest that the initiative rested with you, not with Mr. Doyle. You are beautiful, madame. You are rich. You are clever intelligent, and you have charm. You could have exercised that charm, or you could have restrained it. You had everything, madame, that life can offer. Your friend's life was bound up in one person. You knew that, but though you hesitated, you did not hold your hand. You stretched it out, and like King David, you took the poor man's one ewe lamb. There was a silence. Lynette controlled herself with an effort, and said in a cold voice, Oh, this is quite beside the point. No, it is not beside the point. I am explaining to you just why the unexpected appearances of Mademoiselle de Beaufort have upset you so much. It is because, though she may be unwomanly and undignified in what she is doing, you have the inner conviction that she has right on her side. That's not true. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. You refuse to be honest with yourself. Not at all. Poirot said gently, I should say, madame, that you have had a happy life, that you have been generous and kindly in your attitude toward others. I have tried to be, said Lynette. The impatient anger died out of her face. She spoke simply, almost forlornly. And that is why the feeling that you have deliberately caused injury to someone upsets you so much, and why you are so reluctant to admit the fact. Pardon me if I have been impertinent. But the psychology is, is the most important factor in the case. Lynette said slowly, Even supposing what you say were true, and I don't admit it, mind, what can be done about it now? One can't alter the past, one must deal with things as they are. Poirot nodded. You have the clear brain. Yes, one cannot go back over the past. One must accept things as they are. And sometimes, madame, that is all one can do, except the consequences of one's past deeds. You mean, said Lynette incredulously, that I can do nothing? Nothing? You must have courage, madame. That is what it seems like to me, Lynette said slowly. Couldn't you talk to Jackie, to Miss Belfour? Reason with her. Yes, I could do that. I will do that if you would like me to do so, but do not expect much result. I fancy that Mademoiselle de Belfort is so much in the grip of a fixed idea that nothing will turn her from it. But surely we can do something to extricate ourselves. You could, of course, return to England and establish yourself in your own house. Even then, I suppose, 
Jacqueline is capable of planting herself in the village, so that I should see her every time I went out of the grounds. True. Besides, I don't think that Simon would agree to run away. What is his attitude in this? He's furious. Simply furious. Poro nodded thoughtfully, and Lynette said appealingly, You will talk to her? Yes, I will do that, but it is my opinion that I shall not be able to accomplish anything. Lynette said violently, Jackie is extraordinary. One can't tell what she will do. You spoke just now of certain threats she had made. Would you tell me what those threats were? Lynette shrugged to her shoulders. She threatened to... Well, kill us both. Jackie could be rather Latin sometimes. I see. Poirot's tone was grave. Lynette turned to him appealingly. You will act for me? No, madame. His tone was firm. I will not accept a commission from you. I will do what I can in the interests of humanity. That, yes. There is here a situation that is full of difficulty and danger. I will do what I can to clear it up, but I am not very sanguine as to my chance of success. Lynette Doyle said slowly, But you will not act for me? No, madame, said Hercule Poirot.